Sure. <laughs> so it jumped in ahead there, didn't it? <laughs> so hello, everybody, and welcome to Bulimia Sucks. I'm your host, Kate Hudson Hall, and thank you so much for listening. Now, this is a platform for people to share relatable, uplifting, and inspiring conversations based on eating disorders. And episodes include their personal stories of where they are now and their difficult journeys and their steps taken into their recovery. And then we also talk to professionals who work with people with eating disorders. My audiobook, Bulimia Sucks, is now live on Audible, on Amazon and iTunes. And if you would be interested and would like a free copy of this, then please email me at katehudsonhall at gmail.com. And then I can send you the code and then you can download it for free. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that I have been busy making coloring books. I'm very excited about my coloring books and they are out now on Amazon. And there is one for bulimia, one for anorexia, one for binge eating and also um, an anxiety stress relieving book. So they display a incredible collection of 35 nice relaxing easy to color patterns and they also contain inspiring quotes on e each of the patterns and then on the opposite page is a motivational question so what you can learn from that specific quote to help you forward in your recovery so if you would like to check those out if you put my name into amazon then they will all come up. So check them out, see what you think. I'd love to hear what you think. So now I'm very excited today. Our guest is Sue Bowles. Now Sue is a survivor turned author, speaker, and master certified life coach. Having done the hard work of healing from childhood rape and eating disorder and other sexual assaults, and being twice suicidal, Sue now defines the effect the life-altering events have on her, whereby the events no longer define Sue. And I love this. She defines them. I love that. Sue leads My Step Ahead, which is an organization committed to breaking the stigma around mental health struggles. You only have to be a step ahead to help the person behind you. That is fantastic. What a great phrase that is, because it says it all. And it's the bedrock to the value Sue brings. She helps stuck people get unstuck by discovering hope, journeying together for the next step ahead. Whether speaking on a, podca look, a podcast, a stage, or one-on-one, -on -one, Sue's enthusiasm is contagious, shining the light of hope wherever the listener needs, cheering them to see their dreams become present reality. Sue also has an award-winning book, This Much I Know, The Space Between, and it's available on Amazon and Kindle. So I'm very excited to speak to Sue and hear her journey and how she takes people and helps people forward. So thank you so much, Sue. Thanks for having me, Kate. I'm looking forward to this. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So this is excellent. Excellent. So now where should we begin? So what do you think? Should we start with your eating disorder? Sure. Um, we can start there. <clears throat> I do want to give a quick trigger warning because the root of my eating disorder is based in some sexual assault and some trauma. So if that is a trigger for someone, I certainly want to give them that opportunity to pause the recording, even stop it if you need to come back, um, have some self-care plan in place and come back when you're ready because I don't want to do anything to injure you or say anything to injure you. Yeah, so. great. Thank you for that, Sue. So having said that, <clears throat> um, when I was excuse me, goodness. Uh, when I was seven years old, I was raped by a classmate. Um, a, a classmate um, enticed me into the woods on the school property and held me against my will for 45 minutes. 
And his last words to me were, don't tell anybody. He went out one side and I left the other side. And I didn't realize the prison those words were going to put me in. It ended up becoming a 15 year secret. And I didn't tell anyone until my senior year of college. Now, it, obviously that's a very traumatic experience. Uh, when you're seven years old, your brain is still developing. And I didn't know what had happened. I didn't have the words. And, and I, no one knew to ask anything in the early 70s. It was not a topic of conversation. It wasn't an issue at all. It was safe to walk to school. Everybody in the neighborhood did. So no one knew to ask. And I didn't know what to say because, again, I didn't have the words. It was at that time that my emotions became frozen. And they became frozen in time for, honestly, decades after that. And that's where my eating disorder started. Now, there was other stuff between then and when I finally started dealing with my eating disorder. You know, there were other sexual assaults from some neighborhood kids. Um, my, you know, I was twice suicidal. Um, so there was just, you know, I grew up in a dysfunctional home. Um, just so there's just a lot. Even in 1991, we did an intervention on my dad, who's now 31 years sober. And um, he, uh, you know, he went into treatment. But mom and dad divorced as, as a result of the intervention. So had all that going on. Gosh. So had, yes, yeah, so, and any of those is a lot for one person to deal with. And for the longest time, I was mad at God. Like, why did you allow that to happen? Why did you let all that stuff happen in my life? And now I've realized that as I have done the hard work of healing, it helps me relate to such a broad audience. And, and, and that's how I see God working it all together for good. How the eating disorder plays into all this is obviously when you have a young a, a trauma in such a young age, your brain rewires itself. It's a scientifically proven fact. Trauma rewires your brain. Yeah, it's also scientific. You. Yeah, it's also scientifically fact that your brain can re get rewired with the right help and treatment. Oh, so that yes. and and and, and that, that neural pathways. Oh yeah, and 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 but and it's hard. It's hard work, but I'm on the other side of that now. So since my brain was rewired. I wasn't processing things correctly from a very young age. So by the time I got to college, my brain was not operating well. And I went to a small college in Northwest Ohio in the United States, and we had one dining hall. And as I was a very insecure person, I, I felt because I was insecure, I wanted to feel valued. So I got my value by being seen. So I was over involved in college because if I was seen, I had value. And if I had value, I mattered to somebody because right. all this time my brain was telling me the opposite of that. So all this is the bedrock to it. <clears throat> so in the dining hall, I may have enjoyed an extra serving of food. It's a human need. Hunger is how your body is designed. But by then my brain had warped things out to feel like there's some paranoia going on. It's like, if I go up there, everyone's going to know Sue has a need. Because you see, when I was involved, when I was over involved and being seen, I had put on the mask and painted the story to everybody on campus that Sue was in control. Sue had it all together. Sue had no needs. And Sue, Sue was just, Sue was just, she was golden. She was just doing fine. So my brain interpreted it that if I went up for food, again, a basic human need, yeah. that people, that I'd be found out, that I'd be found out that I had a need and I didn't want my cover blown. So instead of going up and getting more food and taking care of what my body needed, I learned to curb my hunger. I shut, I shut off, I, I dumped my tray, I got out of Dodge and I would snack later to curb the hunger not knowing that that was the start of my eating disorder. And then it just kind of continued, um, you know, where with, with the emotional stress of the divorce and different things, obviously I wasn't eating well at all. And, and I started losing a significant amount of weight. Um, I, was not, I was not well. I was not well at all. And it really wasn't until, well, I'm back up. I was in and out of counseling for a while. <clears throat> I even had a time span where it seemed everything was fine, eating was fine, no big deal. And then 2005 happened. Right. And I lost, I lost a very dear friend to cancer. Oh, and I didn't know how to deal with those emotions again. And it was three years later, 2008, I was still grieving my friend as if it happened yesterday. And then all my red flags of my eating disorder started coming back up. 
So I reached out for help to my, my pastor who connected me with a counselor. I have been with her since. She's an eating disorder specialist, um, deals with trauma and sexual assault and all kinds of things. It was just a perfect match. Yeah, so yeah. 2008, I finally started at least back in the counseling. But even then, her name's Amanda. She is with Grace Recovery Counseling over here in the States. And even in then, she said that we had to get me stronger in the present before we could deal with the past. Because yeah. even, even in that time, I had a lot of boundary issues. I didn't know how to speak up for myself. I didn't, I was a people pleaser, as are most people who have some kind of, of eating disorder. They, all you know, mm-hmm. oh, all, all the performance stuff, mm-hmm. all that, and, and inside you're quietly dying, yeah. li- literally and figuratively. So it wasn't really until 2014 that Amanda and I finally started dealing with the eating disorder and and the rape and all the emotions. Um, I went into recovery of my eating disorder in 2016 when I started working with a dietitian because up to then I had dodged Amanda's recommendations and you know <laughs> no, I'm good I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah so I, I got it Amanda I'm I'm good yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll take care of this yeah 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 mm. and then you know when we started dealing with the rape things started tanking again and she was not relenting that time there I mean I tried dodging it for four or five weeks and it just did not happen so I finally gave up it's like I am not going to win this one and I've I've been with with a dietitian ever since and uh you know, here I am on the other side now. Wow. It's not, it's not for the faint of heart at all. And it's nothing. No one can do it alone. I'll tell you that much right now. No one can do it alone. Yeah, absolutely. I can certainly relate. I was, uh, I was sexually abused when I was nine. And mm. then I didn't actually speak to anybody about it until I found the right therapist. But I was in my well, late 20s, I was 30 or so, Mm -hmm. and I finally found the therapist that really helped me to work through that. I didn't ever talk about it to anyone, just bury me. Right. I I didn't tell anyone until my senior year of college, and it ended up coming out in the conversation with my dean of students, which he's, I've had the privilege of telling him face to face how influential he has been in my life. Mm -hmm. That, That was the dream for me. I, I value greatly telling someone how they've affected my life and for such a pivotal moment in a person's life to be able to go back and tell that person decades later that Ed, you, that one question you asked me and everything that happened after that, start, it started breaking the wall and now the wall's down. That was just, that was a treasured moment. Wow. And what was it he asked you? Ed had, Ed knew when I was troubled. He had become kind of my counselor for the four years. My senior year, he moved over to the president's office. He knew that I wasn't really um, ready for, ready to graduate. And we were trying, he was trying to help me with different things. So he gave me homework each week. So we were discussing the homework. And honestly, I can't remember what the conversation was about. He asked some question and, and I, I didn't even know it was going to come out. I didn't know it wanted to come out. I didn't know there was anything to come out. And I trailed off on this soliloquy and basically said, well, when society tells you, and my voice kind of trailed off and, and, and being very astute, he, he, he asked me, he said, Sue, did somebody hurt you? And I said, yeah. He said, did you pick your parents? And I said, no, no, somebody else. He said, what happened? That was it. That was the course of the conversation that literally changed, started, started the change, was, was finally telling somebody. Yeah. I didn't know it wanted to come out. And then he, I was seeing a counselor in town. He asked if I told him. I said, no, I haven't told anybody. So he went with me the following week to, to tell the counselor. And even then, I was shadow boxing, and Ed called me on the carpet to, about it in front of the counselor because I, I wasn't answering anything. And um, yeah, that, that helps. Saying it once is one thing repeating it yeah. is where the power and the freedom starts coming from, even though it doesn't feel like that to start with. Yeah. It doesn't feel like that at all, but that really is the power of starting to share the story. But even then it wasn't until 2014 that I finally accept and owned my story. Um, there was a retreat program over here in the States called walking stick retreats. And um, there's a, a Christian musician. I don't know if you're familiar with him named Rich Mullins. And um, his, one of his big songs was Awesome God, and he, he toured the world. Um, 
his family and friends do this retreat program. And this movie came out about his life. And it was a hard watch because it hit so many hit hit so many spots. I did a lot of silent wiping of the tears. I got something in my eye, mom, you know, that kind of thing. And and they did a retreat um, and they've done retreats since. That first year at the retreat, I owned my story because as odd as it sounds, I had not owned it up to that point in time. I didn't like my story. I was in denial about my story and I had to own it. And that was, that was also the same year that Amanda and I had started working on it. So even though we had been working on it for a number of months, because the retreat was in October, I still hadn't really owned it and accepted it. And, and, and that, that happened that first year, and that just opened the floodgates to healing. The next year, I had to grieve my story, because there's a lot, a lot to grieve. Yeah. And then the third year, finally, and coincidentally, the third year is also the year I finally started working with a dietitian. And that third year, I finally started believing that I had something to say and that I'm valuable to God and that my life matters and what I have to say matters. And again, that's, it was just a whole springboard of things, but it all started with that one question from Ed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Oh, and and how magical that you actually got to talk to him about it now oh, yeah. to yeah to thank him oh yeah such it a was, miracle in your life yeah i mean and, and you know no one knows the power of a conversation you don't know at that moment the power of a question or a word or an encouragement or a challenge mm-hmm. and you may not see that that result or or the fruit of that for years to come ed did not know what I was going to say. And Ed didn't know what I was going to do with it because ultimately we are responsible for what we do about how things affect us. You know, we can let it affect us or we can turn the table and we can write the, write the, write the story about it. Absolutely. We have a choice. Right. But awareness is the first step. Very much so. Very much so. You know, I, you know, I, I never called it an eating disorder. I called it anorexic tendencies. I called it odd eating behaviors. I never called it an eating disorder. And and oddly enough, people in my life didn't really, didn't really know how to challenge me. There was one time I was challenged. That was by my pastor. And, you know, we were at at a a youth retreat and I was a youth leader and we were talking about something and he got, he, he got on me and he said, Sue, you're dying. You're killing yourself. And my first thought, because it's how your eating disorder brain works, was, yeah, so what? And but I, I knew better than to say that to him. <laughs> I, yeah, I was, yeah. And I was new enough to not say that. But as a result of that, you know, I, I took a six-month break from the activities I was in because I needed to work on me. Um, that was the first time someone challenged me about it. But even then... Yeah, I'd go over to their house for dinner and they'd kind of look at my roommate of, well, how much does Sue want? You know, because it, it was just awkward. No one knew how to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember my family when I was going through my difficult time with bulimia, my family would, you know, they didn't know how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And my mother did approach me. Well, I remember twice. You know, and I was in complete denial. I didn't know what she was talking about. Who me? Sure. It wasn't me. It's not me. No, no, no. I don't. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, absolutely not. And it's right. just, you know, you have to be, you have to be ready to mm-hmm. take that step onto that recovery path. But right. I think by her approaching me about it, even though I know one time I did get very angry with her, but she was setting seeds. Mm-hmm that um, I consciously and unconsciously would be thinking about right. further forward. Yep, very much so. Yeah. So even if, you know, you have a loved one that has an eating disorder or if somebody does that's listening, you know, finding the right time when you're ready, having the knowledge behind you and approaching them. And if they do... Uh, reject you in some way which is quite common um it's i think it's important to remember that you are um they know that you're there for them and they will be thinking about what you said Mm -hmm. even if it's not consciously 
Right. You are setting those seeds. Very much so. And, and, and that's why it's so important to speak up. That's why it's important to, to lovingly express concern and not make it about the behavior, not make it about appearance, but simply, you know, I've noticed some changes in, and I, I'm concerned for you. You know, I've noticed the personality change. I've noticed the withdrawal. You know, but, but to keep the focus off the food and make it because the food, the food is the shield. But when you can get behind that and see and start addressing, you know, you don't seem as happy as you as you used to be. Yeah. Those kind of things that starts getting more to the core of the emotional side of it. That's trying to be covered because ultimately under an eating disorder is an immense amount of pain. Eating disorders have nothing to do with food. That's just the way they come out. It has to do with emotions that are not, and, and oftentimes trauma, it has to deal with, with something that hasn't been dealt with. And that's just the way it comes out. It might be an insecurity. It might be a trauma. It might be um, some kind of abuse. It could be any number of things, but whatever it is, it has not been dealt with correctly. And therefore that's the way the body has found a way to get it out. You know, the book, The Body Keeps the Score is so true. It's going to find a way to come out. Well, it has to find so, a way. You know, it has to be with reaching out for alcohol. It could be for right. having huge anxiety, panic attacks. Mm -hmm. Right. You yeah. Know, it could be, it could be with, yeah, it could be any, any sort of way. Mm -hmm. Right. But they, right. Those, all those emotions and feelings have got to come out, haven't they? Right. And, 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 and it's, you know, and it's hard work I mean, because we, we get in that position because we don't want to deal with the emotions. So then we have to deal with the emotions at the root on top of everything else that we've piled on top of it, trying to protect ourselves. So it is not easy work, but, the, but that's where, where I get to be a voice of hope and say, it is possible. You've just heard the thumbnail sketch of everything I've gone through in my life. My mom lived with me across the hallway and I was her caregiver for the last eight years of her life. She moved in with me in 1997. The last eight years of her life her heart, has her, her health started to decline. She passed away 13 months ago. Yeah. And yet, you know, add that to the list. Yeah. And yet I'm still here to tell you it is possible. Yeah. You can't do it alone, but it is possible. Yeah. I, I always say that when... So my, when I was, I had, so I found a therapist and I spent four years with her and she was my miracle mm -hmm. in helping me and guiding me forward. And at that time, uh, my mother got cancer. She mm. had cancer for two years and then she suddenly got an infection and died suddenly because I never oh. had a father. He died when I was two. And so mm. she was like my mother and father all rolled into one. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that if I hadn't been seeing that therapist, I wouldn't be here today. Because I understand it was that. So traumatic for me, mm -hmm. but she was such a rock for me. Mm -hmm. I understand that. I, I had I had told a man and my counselor because we had been down to just every two weeks, and um, and I told her it's like you know whenever that she knew that that was the day I dreaded, and we did I actually did a lot of anticipatory grief work a couple, about a year and a half, two years in advance. So this is I was just fearing, you know, and just kind of started working on some stuff. Um, but I told Amanda, I said, Amanda, you know, it's my biggest fear. And whenever that day comes, you and I are going weekly. <laughs> and I just told her that straight out. And, and we've been weekly since, and I'm convinced I would not be where I am today in my healing without her. Yeah. And it's really, really only been the last four to six weeks that there's been a real shift where I've able, been able to, to let mom go and not try to hold her foot, you know, on earth when she's already in heaven. Um, you know, and just let go and, and realize that there's, there's, there's no guilt in, in moving forward. And I'm not forgetting her by moving forward. I'm actually honoring her legacy of resilience. So it's been a whole process, but it's, it's been really good. But again, I, I, you know, I know Amanda keeps saying, you're the one doing the work. It's like, yeah. yeah, but you're guiding me, you know, you're, you're, you're helping me to have the courage to do it. So yeah, yeah. to have the courage to do it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so when you think back, what were the reasons for you to recovery, for your recovery, for you to step on that recovery path? Wow. Uh, my brother, he, he, I think he's the one that got it going. My, my, my youngest brother, 
there's alcoholism runs in our family and, and eating disorders are an addiction. So I have an addictive personality. My dad and my brother also have addictive personalities. Both of theirs came out through alcohol. They are both now in recovery. But my brother was in, in a drunk driving accident and had to serve 18 months prison over here in the States. And when he got back out, um, this is 20, 2014, so are you seeing the same combination of the year here, 2014, and I started dealing with everything? Yeah, um, yeah. 2014, he got out, and he, as he when he came home, he was seeing friends. Like, Man, I haven't seen you for a while. Where have you been? And he just bold facedly said, "In prison." And that really struck me. I was like, if my brother, who would have any reason to keep a secret, if he didn't want to tell anybody, he didn't need to tell anybody. If he was being able to be that authentic, yeah. I wanted to be that authentic. And that's when I went to my counselor and said, I just want to be authentic. Get me ready for this retreat. We spent six weeks dealing with my fears and my anxiety so I could go into that retreat and, and be ready just to deal with things. Um, so honestly, my brother, because I, I, I wanted to live what I saw him living so boldly. And I'm the older sister and I wasn't able to do that. Um, and that really challenged me. And, you know, and, and as anyone knows, when you're in, 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 in an eating disorder, you know, you get tired of lies. I got tired of trying to keep track of what lie I was, I was following for who, which was, which person, what did I tell who, you know, and then how am I going to backtrack if I get caught in this, you know, so I, it just got exhausting, but honestly, it was, I just, I just got tired of it. I just, I wanted to be authentic and my brother set that tone for me. Wow. Wow. So, so, Sue, what advice would you give somebody that is, you know, thinking about stepping onto that path of recovery? Wow, so much to say, but the bottom line comes down to dare to believe that you are worth it. Because until you believe that, until you give yourself a shred of hope that something can be better for yourself, nothing will change. Dare to believe that you matter and dare to believe that there is something better for you. And then as you dare to believe, invite someone, trust someone to go on the journey with you. you Got to reach out for help. You cannot do it alone. When we isolate, we get in the situations we're in. Don't listen to what your eating disorder is telling you. Do the exact opposite. If it's saying isolate, then reach out. But the first step is dare to believe that you matter. Because until you believe that somewhere deep in the core, nothing will change. Because we all want that hope. I'm a hope coach. I'm a voice of hope because I want others to dare to believe that they matter. And you do matter. And, and, and my, my, that's, my, that's my, my, my exhortation is just to dare to believe that you matter. And then the next steps, like point 1A and 1B, dare to believe you matter and dare to believe you matter enough that someone is willing to help you and reach out for help. Wow, what inspiring words. Very inspiring words. Mm -hmm. So what does uh, freedom from your eating disorder, what does that mean to you? Well, it's still a fight at times. You know, just because I'm free doesn't mean I still don't struggle. Um, right. You know, holidays right now are a prime. You know, it's the day before Thanksgiving here in the States. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I'm on vacation. So I met with my dietitian two weeks ago. And we know that when my regular routine is upset, my eating schedule can get upset. So this week, my goal, my focus is just, okay, make sure you're eating your meals because I can quickly fall back into my old patterns of eating, you know, one meal a day or whatever, just because I get caught up on stuff. So while I'm free, it doesn't mean I don't struggle. But what freedom means is that I'm aware of myself now and that I have power over my eating disorder and it no longer controls me. Just like, just like I was talking about before, I can let my eating disorder control me or I can control it. Now, it doesn't mean I'm perfect in that. It doesn't mean I don't, you know, give in to, you know, whatever here or there. But then I, because I dare to believe I'm worth it and I invited somebody else in, I have a trusted dietitian that even if I've gotten off course, I can reach out to her. 
So, so freedom means that I still have that support system in place and I know how to use them. And I know to give myself grace if I slip, but I also know how to right the ship when I do that. And, and all of those were things that I didn't know how to do when I was trapped in my eating disorder. Because again, eating disorders are shrouded in secrecy. I didn't want to be found out. I couldn't be imperfect. Yeah. And, 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 and now you know, I've got the system in place. I have the tools. It's my choice if I use them. And if I have those lapses where, for whatever reason, I'm just not getting there, then that's where I can get with my dietitian or my counselor or both and say, okay, something went off here. Let's figure out what this is and shore this up a little bit because I am not going back to where I was, period. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's having, particularly, you know, for people in the States this week, and then we've got Christmas coming up soon, it's actually making that conscious effort decision of what mm -hmm. you're going to you know what you're going to be particularly aware of what maybe what you're going to change mm -hmm. and and making it all conscious right and bring it to your conscious mind think okay well i'm going to a dinner tomorrow and you know for my you know turkey dinner what am i going to do here mm -hmm. how can i somewhat stay in control maybe if you're at mm -hmm. that stage and um what can i do to support myself right yeah for, for me you know this is our second thanksgiving without mom we've done cornish hens in the past so my brother's work gave them like a 10 a 10 or 12 pound turkey so i'm like i haven't done a turkey in like years so I told him, Scott, it's you, me, and a cookbook. <laughs> so we're we're going to figure this out, and, and I think it'll be fine. But you know, already earlier this week, I've had to fight, you know, whispers from. Ed. I gave my eating disorder a name. His name Ed. Ed's been trying to whisper this week of, you can't do this. You're stupid. You're incompetent. All these things, and I'm like, and 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 I have realized that, and and I find myself getting a little anxious about. It. I'm like, stop, just, just stop. You know where that's coming from. It's not the end of the world. And just do what you know to do and, and just give yourself that, that break. Yeah. But I, I feel a little stress going into tomorrow because of that. So I already have a plan in place. I, you know what? Whatever happens, happens. If I can't handle it, then I'm gonna talk to my bro about it, you know, and, and, and reach out and whatever. It's gonna be fine. It's, it's more the, the mental than it is anything else. Yeah. Uh, we managed to make it fun. But, but I realized that I have some extra emotional anxiety going into tomorrow. Yeah. Because, yeah. because the holiday, because I not have mom, add in a turkey. Really, a turkey is just a big Cornish hen. So there's really no big deal, Sue. So I, I'm doing a lot of self talk right now. Um, but again, you know, going into it, being aware of whatever that trigger might be, whatever is trying to whisper your name, and just telling it to shut up. Yeah, yeah, when, absolutely. When, tell it to stop, tell it to get yeah. lost. When, when, I, when I was early in recovery, I still remember this, when my brain started getting more clear. And, and, and it was because I was finally feeding it the way it needed to. My, my counselor, my dietitian kept telling me, that's your eating disorder voice. You are not your eating disorder. And she just kept saying that. And I didn't realize for the longest time what she meant. And I was in the kitchenette at work one day. And, and I was kind of feeling, you know, my, my trigger, you know, my, my red flag again of if I can't make a food decision, I shut the refrigerator door and get out of Dodge. And, and I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And, and, and I started literally talking out loud to my eating disorder, not for the office to hear, but it was Ed, shut up, Ed, shut up. And then I opened the refrigerator, I got my yogurt and I was just fine. So that I, you know what, yeah. I, I might be five and a half years in the recovery, but if I need to go back to that tomorrow, that's a tool in my toolbox. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's an old one, doesn't get used anymore. But sometimes you gotta go back to the basics. Yeah, and that's absolutely. okay, that's why, that's why the basics are the basics. Yeah. So tomorrow, if I'm having a conversation with Ed, I'm gonna tell him to shut up yeah. and get out of my kitchen. I'm gonna have some fun, you know? So get out yeah. my, my kitchen. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like your, your kitchen is mine, you know? So, you know, but that, that is all part of defining the effects of the trauma and the eating disorder and no longer letting it define me. I said, I'm not going back to that. Mm -hmm. That might mean I have to fight a little harder at times, 
But that's what freedom means, is that freedom isn't one once. Why do you think every country, even though they're free, still has armed forces and military to protect that freedom? They are still fighting to protect that. Just because I am free doesn't mean I don't have to fight to protect it. Same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm aware that this will go out in January, okay. and but it doesn't mean to say that, you know, God, blame me, we... We all have different big events throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, listen to what Sue has said and, and learn from her because it's powerful information that you've given us here today. Well, and, and, and yeah, it might not be a holiday. It might be a birthday. It might be an anniversary. Yeah. It might just be something that blindsides you that you are not expecting on a sunny day and you're out at a park having fun. Anything can, can trigger you. Anything can try to sweep you out, out, sweep you off your game. So okay. it doesn't matter if it's a big event or a little event. There, there, it's all common ground. There is no, this is bigger than this. Everything matters because you matter. So whatever matters to you is what you need to fight for. Yeah, yeah. So Sue, um, so where are you now? with regards to the work that you're doing tell us a bit about that and then also about your book yes i am a master certified life coach specializing as a hope coach yep. because no nothing happens without hope and, and if someone's reaching out they have a glimmer of hope and i and i and i want to watch that flicker turn into a flame so that that's what i do in terms of my coaching uh it has been a joy uh, you know earlier this year in 2021 I, I was working with a mother-daughter team that had a huge falling out around the holidays with COVID. They had ranked their relationship 10 out of 10, dropped down to a four out of 10. And when they finished coaching, they were back up to an eight out of 10. And they said, I think we got it. We got, you gave us the tools, we're good to go. You know, so, so watching those things happen, somebody else yeah. wanted to leave you know, a very, very, you know, it's very lucrative you know, professional job because it, was, it just wasn't meeting him anymore. So we went through some career shifting. Um, so coaching, it, it, it's a joy to, to watch people embrace the adventure, you know, of, of, of discovery, of self-discovery, of what else can I do? What do I really want to do? What can I do? What do I want to learn? You mean I'm allowed to? Yes, you're allowed to. Let's go for it. So that, that has been that's been a thrill of watching, watching, just being able to walk along people's journey and, and, and giving them the springboard and helping them develop the skills they need to, to run. And that's really all I do. I help them develop skills so they can go run. And um, how, how can people find you, Sue? Their best thing is to go to SueBowles.com. And I offer a 15 minute free consultation. I do it all virtually. So it doesn't matter what country they are in. I'm happy to work with people. Um, it's all held over, over Zoom or some other video platform. But I offer 15 minute consultations. There's a form on the website. They can just send me some information and, uh, and I'd be happy to get in touch with them and see if I can help them see their dreams become reality. Oh, gosh. And we'll <laughs> leave the details below as well. So people just in case they, you know, they, they want to grab the information from from there and tell us about your book this much i know the space between tell us oh there, you, there it is hey there it there, is there it is who's <laughs> holding up our door <laughs> uh, i love the cover thanks the the book came out in september 2019 and it, it's my story it's actually the first of the three-part trilogy so uh the concept is, is of this much i know this much I know is my story. Each of us have a story. And that is the one thing nobody can take from us. So this much I know is my story. That's the one short fire thing in life. The space between is the healing journey I went on from going from having wounds to the healing to having scars. Uh, if you're watching the video behind, behind me, there's a quote from Rich Mullins, and it says, it's not going to matter if you have a few scars. It will matter if you didn't live. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's the concept behind this, is that mm -hmm. a wound is still bleeding. It's still uh, subject to infection. It's still an active, an active problem. But when it heals, and healing is painful, Think of when you break a bone, they put it in a cast. Your arm hurts because the, the bones are, are, are fusing themselves back together. But it hurts. Healing is painful. Yeah. If you cut yourself, you have surgery, the stitches hurt. But when it all heals and you have a scar, that becomes a story. 
that becomes a, a sign of hope for somebody. Your, you know, your scars can be a sign of hope for somebody else. So as I talked about at the beginning, I have a lot of woundedness in my life, but those wounds are now scars and I get to tell their stories to help somebody else. So that's the concept of the book. The first half is my story, goes in a lot more detail of what we talked about. Um, and, and then second, the second half goes through the process that, they, that I went through of having to own my story, grieve my story, believe that I was worthwhile. And, and that's the, and, and just that whole process. I'm working on book number two. Um, actually, this book is available on Amazon and Kindle. So uh, you can get it there. There's also links to it on my website. And uh, working on book number two, it's going to be called the, the, This Much I Know, It's Okay to Not Be Okay. And that one's going to talk more about the, about the masks we wear, why we feel like we can't be authentic, why we want to convince somebody that we're something we're not, and, and, and talk about different steps, you know, different steps and resources to kind of start breaking that down. The third one is going to be called 45 Minutes in Time. And that's going to talk about life's defining moments, because that is the length of time I was held against my will. It's not necessarily going to talk so much about the event, but about redefining and re-sculpting defining moments in our lives and turn them on, turning them on their head, much as, as I've been able to do. So. Amazing. Amazing. So when so. when do you think that uh, the second book will be finished? Um, I'm hoping late 2022. That's what I'm hoping for. I, I actually had, I had, I had take, a, take a year off um, after mom passed. I had no creative energy in my life. Um, so it's all coming back. So I'm hoping late 2022, but they can go to my website and they can, you know, uh, that one. I also have another website called my step ahead, my step ahead.com. And that's just more of an encouragement one. They can subscribe for updates at that website as well. Um, and then um, I've got a newsletter I send out and that kind of stuff. Amazing. And, and if they subscribe, uh, for the newsletter, then I also have a three-part PDF called a hope bundle that I'll be happy to send them. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, fabulous. Well, Sue, thank you so much. You've been an inspiration, so inspirational and such a journey you've been on that mm -hmm. it's been incredible for you to share, share this 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 path this difficult path that you've been down i appreciate the opportunity but what i hope people hear is that none of this happened by myself all of it happened because i took that first step and dared to reach out and i want to challenge them to do the same wow i'm blown away incredible sue thank you so much uh, i appreciate the time thanks so much kate thank you so that's all for today's episode of Bulimia Sucks. And thank you to everybody for listening. And make sure that you come and check out um, and find us on our Facebook page, which is called Bulimia Sucks, where you can come and connect with like-minded people and we can learn from each other. So thank you for listening. And I look forward to chatting with you in the next episode. <laughs>